So I'm continuing to put up these poorly made uh, videos, and you know, to start, maybe 10 years from now, you'll come back and say, oh, they're actually not that. Um, not these ones, but the ones 10 years from now. Anyway, but they are at least records of what uh, madness was said. Um, I'll continue to do that and work on that, so, so that's good. We have the, the tweets. We, there, was a, there was a call for, uh, for tweeting about the course, which I wondered if I could do, so I'm happy to do that. So if you are a, um, if you're excited about tweets, then uh, you can you can slot them in. I have talked about this, but yeah, the, uh, we have a hashtag for our course. Obviously, if you go horribly wrong, so <laughs> social shaming and so on should help you um, keep you from doing bad things. So, but I can't control the rest of the world. Anyway, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that's what, that's a good thing. So I'll send emails. I have to send emails to you guys, but I will. Um, Imagine if I had to call you by phone. That would really be <laughs> So I'll still send emails, which I'm kind of done with, but um, I sort of hate email. Uh, but, but I'll tweet as well, so that's good. Uh, you know, so Donald Knuth, right, is one of the most famous uh, computer science characters. Pretty crazy. So he gave up email in, I think it was like January 1, 1990. So this is just a huge waste of my life. And he became an emeritus professor early on at Stanford, so he finished his great work on and he's still going. So, um, yeah. Email. Great. Uh, Alright, so that's just so, uh, right, so things keep building. Uh, I had a couple of little asides to start with. Today we're going to talk about, um, uh, as I said, this Herbert Simon story. It's a rich gets, it's the first part of this rich gets richer story. And then we have the fight with Man of Right coming out next week. Uh, and depending on how I go with this, if I finish, I'll talk a little bit more about projects. Okay, so that will be things work. So here's, here are some amusing insights. So uh, there are lots of these kind of quotes. So Ernest Rutherford, a very famous uh, physicist, ran in New Zealand. Um, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. I think Dirac said something. I kind of thought Dirac said something like that as well. Something along, it must be, but it's something along the lines of my, my equations explain all of chemistry and the rest is just stamp collecting. Anyway, this is sort of turn of the century, you know, 900 kind of uh, view of the world. And we'll get to a point later on where we see a paper that appeared in Science 70, uh, 972 or 3 that, that said, really, you shouldn't be saying these things. You still are saying these things, but uh, there's some other stuff. So Richard Feynman, you may have heard of this guy as well. Uh, social science is an example of a science which is not just like that. Uh, so, and, so they're very rude people, physicists. So we're, we're sort of, I've grown as one, and I'm going to help you see how the good parts of physics come out to... Uh, to understand the rest of the world. Uh, and we have Sheldon Cooper as well. So, actually not a show I watch because it's a little too close to the bone, but um, I know these sorts of human beings. Let me see if I can get that to work. All right, I'll have to read it. This is for you. Okay. Hello, Sheldon. Danny, Danny, Danny. This is for you. Hello, Sheldon. questionnaire I devise. I'm having some difficulty bonding with a colleague at work, so I'm doing a little research to better understand why my current friends like me. Yes, well, that is a good question. But is this really the best way to figure it out? Yeah, I agree. The social sciences are largely hokum. But, short of putting electrodes in your brain and monitoring your response to my companionship, this is the best I can do. Thank you. Um, anyway, so there are I mean, it, it is fun to get inside of any, any sort of human activity and find out just how much you know, the individuals loathe each other, um, usually in large groups, which is fun. So, uh, you know, I can't help talk about these things as we go through it, but um, everyone thinks they're superior in some way, which is good. So social scientists think they have all theories and the ideas, they're the only ones that have the real ideas, they're the ones that have the questions. Um, and so they, they look on that. The, the take on the physics and computer sciences, they're just a bunch of uh, maniacs with algorithms and that's all they care about. They just, they have tools and they like to use their tools. So. Just, just terrible. Uh, so, anyway, all right. that's that's possibly more for my own reason. Alright, so, uh, the, the things, oh, I have this nice little piece. So, Andrew Gelman, this is, this is so we've had this, these parallel distributions, right? Size distributions. Uh, 
There's a little piece that, that Gelman put in, uh, had in the New York Times yesterday. And he is, uh, so he's a professor of statistics and political science at Columbia. When I was there, I would meet with him regularly. He would come to our group meetings. Um, great guy, right? Super, I, I'm not sure if he sleeps in, in, in any way, possibly an hour a day. Uh, anyway, so he has this uh, observation that, and I'll show you the figure, right? So here's the story. Um, a couple of points in here. So we've got these skewed distributions. So it's true, what I'm trying to say is it's true for names as well. Right? There are, there's a club of Michaels, for example. If you're a Michael, you can join a club for people named Michael. There are a lot of Michaels. Um, and this changes over time, somewhat slowly, but it's changed more recently, so there's more diversity. So his story here is there's more diversity of names. There are just, you know, people are inventing names, there are more names that people are choosing, they're, they're seeing outside of their, you know, it's not just the saints or something that you know, are using as a list. Uh, things are moving out a little bit. But there are some... This is great. There's a great observation here, and you, you want to look at this in a bigger data story. So, uh, so the boys' names ending in N, there was about 14% of them. And so there were names ending in S and E and D. Um, you can see that it probably would be taken up by just a few. Okay. Um, so James would be the S. Uh, but now it's, uh, let's see, so now it's 40%. Sure what that number is. But now it's moved to something like 40% of them. Boys' names are ending in N. So while there's a bigger diversity in names, the sounds and so on have closed in as well. And he has a great line, so Aiden, Jaden, Hayden. Right? So there's also work by Jonah Berger, who's at the uh, Wharton School at uh, Penn, uh, looking at phonemes as well, and so seeing how they get copied. So we tend not to copy exactly the name because that's a little, it's a little psycho to copy something exactly, right? So I mean, we uh, will come to slang that term. We love to copy. That's a huge part of what we are. We're fantastic imitators, uh, and so you might not know that you're emulating people around you in all sorts of ways. In language, for example, accents. Right? We talk. We talk. We learn. Really good. At, we're great at this. Um, but uh, he has this great line at the end. We have we we have new freedom in naming our children, and we use that freedom to conform. So there's a little. Plot that went with this. So these are the, the so if, now you're sort of getting a handle of these parallel distributions. This is you can see this is just a very thin glimpse of it. So the ten most common names. This is a fraction of them that have it in the ten most common names. So boys is declining, girls is declining. So um, there's there's a richer distribution, right? It's not it's less of a sort of a winner takes all situation. And this is just this one category: boys names any and n. That's gone. So. So this is, so the, actually the baby name stuff sounds kind of a little silly, but it's, it's been a, a really rich vein for sociologists and other social scientists in studying culture, the evolution of culture. Being a, you know, we, we have a lot more data now, but uh, we had, we've for a long time had great, great data on baby names. So you can see how things move around, and you can think about class, and, um, where people uh, start, where they finish, and so on. Um, anyway, another fun piece of But it does leave out the much bigger picture. It's just the tiniest glimpse of those things. All right, so let's talk about... This. Yes. This is not... I've taken to kind of trying to like use any surface to move things. You know, like I'll start, I'll find that I'm, you know... <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um, all right, open no So there are a couple of pieces to this, this set of slides. So we're going to have this growth mechanism story and then optimization. So there's randomness built into this story. It's a growth mechanism, so there is this procedural structure and a, a good algorithm, but there's a lot of randomness built into this. This story is about optimization. So you can imagine these are these sort of two competing stories for how we go up through layers of complexity. Um, things happen by accident, or is there some sort of great, grand, universal story of how we, you know, do we end up with the perfect language, do we, uh, we really good organisms, is platypus some sort of paragon of organisms? Probably not. Um, so, and that's, you know, it's going to be some battle between these two things, for sure, and, and we've had more nuanced stories that have uh, come out of this, this is actually from the 1950s, right, this is the Man of Us story, which is, uh, was published in 53, this is Herbert Simon, published in 55. So, and then we'll see them uh, 
go, uh, go up against each other in, in the literature, which is kind of fun. If they were living in a world of tweets and blogs, I guess they would have done it more rapidly, but um, we'll get to that. Okay, so random copying. We've, we've looked at random walks, and I, I just sort of want to present that to you as a really simple story uh, that, that you, know, you need to know the, the most basic things and where you can get uh, the size distributions from in the simplest possible way. As I've said, there are a million ways to get these parallels. Trying to give you the big stories. Um, you know, the Michaels of the, uh, the parallel stories. Uh, okay, so random walks. Uh, uh, simply additive aggregation. Right? So there is memory, it's just the memory of where you are right now, and you add plus or minus one, depending on the details of the walk. It's very normal sorts of ways, but that's the story. You don't remember where you've been before that. But it is additive. Okay, and it's, when I say additive, I mean potentially. You know, you're adding negative quantities. So that's, that's what's going on. And we're, com we're combining all these realizations to get a story. So the normal distribution, we're thinking about all them combined, what we get when we look at a whole uh, ensemble of them. Uh, the same with the uh, uh, first return, we're thinking about well, what happens when we have many of them. There's no sense that these random walks are competing against each other. Right? We're letting them all run. Here's one, here's another, here's another one. Let's look across the spectrum of them. Okay, so competition is going to be a big piece. Of so we're going to move on to this, but, and this is just my framing of these things. Uh, random additive or copying uh, and copying processes. Right? So there's some, it's growing in some way, uh, and it's growing through copying, and there's a lot of randomness. And the key thing is competition. The, well, one of the key parts here is competition. Alright, so, you see, it could be argued for in all of these situations. You know, the details will often be much finer and so on, and not really true. Now, what I'm going to show you is not how you would write a book, for example, but it might be how a language involves. So, word cities, the web. Uh, so, cities, of course, you have people moving in, moving out. You can think about uh, complications of these mechanisms where you have uh, loss as well. But we'll be thinking about growth. It's a simple story. Uh, so, cities, of course, are people migrating and moving and growing. Uh, as cities growing, so some cities grow, of course, much faster than others. Um, Think about what that might be. Some cities are good places to come from. Some cities are good places to go to. Um, uh, so uh, wealth accrues to uh, people who have wealth, depending on how clever their tax schemes are and so on. But you know that, that that's traditionally been true. Um, productivity. So this is scientific productivity. So this is one of the uh, few cornerstone laws in biblio uh, bibliometrics. It's from the 20s, so looking at how many papers scientists put out. And we, we can study this more and more and more. Work, recent work where people are using a, a, a kind of topic extraction algorithms to see how ideas evolve and, and move through the scientific literature, which we now have so much data for, of course. And of course, we have a beautiful story for scientific literature because we have the citations. So you can see this massive expansion of knowledge. Trace um, you know, fads, for example, in science is full of fads where people take off with ideas and everyone jumps on top of it. Physicists are really good at doing that. Um, it's kind of like soccer. I'll probably say this again. It's like kids playing soccer, right? It all squirts out and you know, we'll jump on top of it. That's basically physics. Um, <coughs> someone might know where to kick the ball. Alright, and as I said before, there are many competing mechanisms. I'll give you these two big ones. Of uh, optimization and, and uh, rich gets richer, but there, are, for many other settings that you can think about, where you have these distributions, you know, there's, there's potentially a specific mechanism that gives rise to it. There has to be growth in some way. There has to be a couple of key elements. Growth is one of them. Randomness is always around in, in any real big system, so that's a nice piece. Uh, but growth is big. So okay. Uh, so this is a, a little history of it, and I'll come back and, and, and go through this again in, in more detail, but just to kind of give you an idea, so, so this is a Yule, and sometimes these distributions we talk about are called Yule, Pareto, Zip, hyphen, 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 zip more together, some people like to put a mantle rod on the end, um, Simon gets a little silly. Um, so that's the number of species per genus. 
So this is, of course, back in the day where we're figuring out where the platypus belongs and so on. It's our version of things that's changed with DNA. Um, uh, that sort of work. But still, you know, I think it's still reasonably old. Um, <laughs> platypus is really an outstanding organism. So uh, I'll come back to the platypus, actually, because it is the only, it, that and the echidna are the only mammals that lay eggs and they have a lower body temperature. That was uh, very different. Kidneys are spiky, porcupine. Yeah. Unless you run. Okay, so um, so this is the number of scientific papers per author, and that varies tremendously. I think I might have mentioned this the number of, yeah, right, the number of citations per paper, paper basis, that varies enormously, with the mode being zero and then just having a carnival decay. So it's so skewed that Google Scholar will give you a, a flag if you get a, as they say, you know, a little hurrah if you get 10 citations for a paper. They'll say, they'll count the number of papers you have that have at least 10 citations. But that's like, well done. Uh, it actually exists. Uh, so Mandelbrot, that's the second part of this. This will be an optimality story, as I said. Um, and Herbert Simon, I can sort of uh, talk about him a little more, but he was at CMU. Uh, so he's a bit of a, he's one of these, Won a Nobel Prize, uh, surprisingly perhaps from economics as a political scientist, sort of, but he didn't do <coughs> um, And so he was uh, in, in trying to figure out Zip Florence, we saw it was 1949 when that book was published, trying to figure it out for city size, uh, this is how he lays it out, income, word frequency, of course, the publication story. So he's, he's expanding this, he's pulling more things together. Uh, Men Bros really focused on language. So this is the biggest story here. Then we have more about scientific citations. This is a very famous uh, a piece of work, uh, somewhat by like Solar Price that actually builds on Simon's model. Uh, so you know, this is hand done, right? looking at citations. So it's very hard to see citations going forward. That's a really horrible problem until today. Right? You look at a paper from whenever, 1960, and you want to find what cites that paper. Well, that's all good now, but 20 years ago, do it. You just didn't know. I mean, you, you couldn't do it. It's really terrible. So, uh, you couldn't do it in a complete way. You wouldn't be able to find out things. But you couldn't do it in a complete way. Alright, uh, so to solve price. And then there's a break. And this is actually kind of forgotten about in some ways. I mean, there's various areas know about it quite well. But then we have some physicists pop in. And this is Lazo Baravazi and Rick Albert. Uh, very, very famous work. Uh, this probably has. 5,000 citations, I think, 6,000, depends if you look on different things. That's not bad. That's strong, okay? Um, so this is about networks, and this is, uh, this, is, this is also about networks. This becomes a bigger story about networks. This is at the start of the big data age, really, and, and kind of busted open the doors on um, thinking about complex systems because we could describe things. That's my point. All right, so there's a history. We're going definitely we're going to focus on these two. We'll come to this later on because it's the big part of complex networks, uh, and we'll see how this connects to all of these cuts here. Right. So here's some recent uh, uh, evidence for Zip's law. So this is from from Linux, from Linux, the Linux operating system, uh, looking at how packages depend on other packages. So of course, when you create these, when you start to create enormous uh, software distributions. Um, you end up with, uh, and these are different releases, so the Saj, they're very funny, like Woody, Saj, Etch, Lenny, yeah, that's your, your Pixar, that's all um, So, <laughs> yeah, listen there. everyone has to have a theme. Yeah. Um, so this is looking at, uh, and this is over time, these are these distributions of the number of incoming links, if you like, between, that's the way of framing it. Um, from packages to other packages. Uh, so this package depends on all these guys, depends on all these guys. And in this work, this is PRL 2008, so it's very recent, right? This is, this is, we're still figuring this out. This, there's, uh, we'll come back to this one. There is evidence for one of Simon or Mandelbrot's story that supports that one. So you can, you can get in and see how it grew. And that's the great thing here, right? We can see how we, we're not just looking at the system as it is right now, which we would for, say, species, right? It's, it's, it's harder, we get through the fossil record, very hard to do, we can, but, um, 
I guess you can. All right, that's all. Uh, you know, go back six thousand years or whatever it is. Um, so we can we can we can get we can really see how these things work. So we'll come back to that. So that's just another area of physics law. In fact, that was a uh, slope of minus one. So. All right, so we'll call it. I'm going to call it. So random competitive replication. All right. So this I'm just going to lay out this algorithm. We'll do a little analysis of it, and I'll leave some pieces for you guys to fill in because we'd love to do that. Um, it's, it's a you know, nice little math escapade again. Uh, you know, Herbert Simon can do it. I'm sure you can. Do it. Right. So. Uh, Let's see. So we start, we're going to start with, and I'll have a picture for this. So imagine this, you start with one element, so if you start with one element and it has a particular flavor. So this might be a city, so someone says I'm going to build a city and stand in a thing and they have a shovel. Um, or it might be a word, so, I think, so it could be book, right? So if we're talking about language, we have a book at the start, we start with books. And we start to add other words later on. So this is how it plays out. So it's, uh, we're going to have discrete time, so you can imagine you can vary all these things in all sorts of ways. We'll try to keep it as clean as possible so we can see what the real ingredients are in this model. Um, you know, sometimes the ingredients seem very benign, but you have to be careful to weigh them all out. So we have, we're just going to have a clock. A new alpha is going to appear, so you can make this random, some sort of random or other, but that shouldn't change anything too much. So we'll have a new element, it's going to arrive, and it's going to have this. Uh, the algorithm is going to work like this. So with probability rho, which will typically be small, we'll create a new element. So we'll start a new city, or it'll be a new word, or it'll be a new flavor. So we'll flavor in general. There's no U in there. It's still bad. Um, with uh, probably, I have to change all the time. Okay, so with probably one minus rho, we uh, we join an existing team. So we join a a city, that this new uh, element that appears joins a, 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 a city that's in a person and move to a city that already exists. Uh, so the way to think about this more generally is that we randomly choose from all the existing elements. It's a very specific aspect of this model and make a copy. So if there are, and I'll have a figure for this, but if there are say 10 uh, flavor, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have it on the next slide. So you're going to actually just choose randomly from everything exists and then copy it. So if you like for cities, okay, for cities, you would randomly choose a person in the United States and then go and live in their city. Now that's a hard thing to do actually, right? Randomly choosing people is a hard thing to do. Um, unless you have a telephone book. I think that was, that was a Steve Martin film? I don't this guy's lucky or whatever in a serial killer, and you cuts to a serial killer who's like, who am I going to kill today? And he opens up a telephone book and points to that guy's name. Is that before you were So that was a nice little bit. Anyway, possibly the only time Steve wants a bit fun. Anyway, so just my take. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay. So uh, but that's a hard that is a hard thing to do. So that is a that if it seems nice, it's random, random, random's easy, right? But randomly choosing from everything that exists is pretty tricky. So we'll get to how that might work for networks in particular later on. And how it might make sense for cities or uh, but that's important. So then we'll do this. So elements of the same flavor form a group. So the people that live in a city, it's very well defined. If the word the word the, take all of those guys and stick them all together in a big group. Um, the word platypus, right? There'll be so many instances of platypus, and you'll say that's a group. So we'll be talking about the individuals and then the groups they form. And switching between those two will matter quite a lot. So you can think of this in a very general way. This is mutation and innovation. The system is right, creating newness, uh, and this is replication imitation with a particular kind of uh, story to it, which is you like to copy things that, that are more prevalent. Right? So big city, lots of people, more of a chance that you will add someone with this thing than a tiny city that has one person. And then you can think about, well, what about all of the cities that have one person in them? As a class, do they do they do okay? Maybe, maybe you know one one tiny little town is not going to get replicated once, but maybe one of those tiny little towns. So you have to think about how this balance might work. 
So, is that okay? So words appear in a language, uh, I've said these things so they appear sequentially, probably go to the next word that's not previously appeared, just to use words instead of words. Um, it's probably one last row, we randomly choose one word that's appeared in the language that's been spoken in the language, or if it's a book, one, we just randomly choose from one of the words beforehand and then copy it. But let's think about a language. Uh, so this mutation innovation, this replication, this is a terrible way to write a novel. But this mechanism is sort of invoked roughly to say that, well, we have these distributions in books. Um, you know, here's kind of a growth thing. It's probably a better way to think about the growth of language, but because both of those things are true. You can take language as a whole, you have these skew distributions, you can take uh, long enough novels, you will have these skew distributions as well. But they're a reflection of language as a well. whole. Alright, so here's a Here's a little example. You can read this. So there are 21 words that exist that have been spoken. There are six books. Right? This is presumably where it started out. And we have these, and we have a few of these. Right? So there's banana, a couple of penguins, and we've always had the thing. And then we're going to want to. Okay, so the next step will be, again, with probably a row, you make a new word. And with probably one minus row, you just choose randomly from these words here. So you can see it. If you want to choose from uh, classes, then you have to wait the class. This is effectively what it's doing. If you want to choose from classes, you want to say, like collapse this down and just say, this is the book class, this is the and class. Then you put a wait next to it, which is simply the number of times it appears. So it's a bigger target. Right, so mathematically, you can do things in different ways. You could say, or mechanistically as well. You could say, well, I'm randomly choosing from these guys. Or I just see the word book, but I see it in big font. Right? Font um, a, a big font size. So that's how I appreciate it as being big. Uh, and so the probability of the next word being one of the ones that exist, if that's what's happening, if it's a replication thing. So the 621th. Uh, probably of it being book and so on, right? There's a 1 in 21 chance that you have a library to be repeated. Oh, yes. Does it seem okay? So it's pretty benign, right? We're not talking about normal distribution anymore. This is, some, this is not going to give us a normal distribution for <coughs> the, the words, right? It's not going to sort of grow some nice normal distribution. Book is, book is when, and this is early on, so. Some of these other words could take over, and that's, a, that's another problem in itself. Uh, but once, it, if it gets far enough out, you know, we get, well, once this language is big enough, we have 10,000 hooks, then you, know, you start to get a really good chance of that happening again and again and again, and it stays in front. And it depends how, so this is a, there's a, there's a linearity that's built into the, this structure that we'll see, okay. uh, because it's just proportional to the number. Really just proportional to the number. You can imagine putting a power here, and we'll come to that later on. You could say, all right, let's, let's put a little power here, and we could tune it so that the power is, you know, what if we had the number of words squared? So that would push this guy up even further, right? And that moves you out to a winner takes all type situation. So then you end up with a language which is just a book, right? And disappear. If it was to a power of, say, half, so that would downplay the, relatively downplay the more common words, then they wouldn't be able to get out in front as much. They'd still win, it'd still be skewed, but it wouldn't, wouldn't take off as much. So there's a bit of a game to think about in real phenomena, if this is a real uh, model, if this is a reasonable model. Is there an exponent? Like, how are these things being chosen? How are they being replicated? And the simplest thing, which is implicit in these, these models, so the way Simon uh, if you put it forward, uh, it was just expressly like this. If when you get to 2,000 with these network models, you have crazy physicists saying, okay, well, why don't we put an exponent in and that? That's a reasonable thing to do. Turns out that this is an incredibly um, rich phenomenon that can happen with this linear or some modification of linear uh, attachment, if you like. Some words I don't want to say. But linearity in this, in this probability of replication 
you can tweak it a little bit and get all sorts of power. Loss. So we'll get to that. Let me say, okay, so if you if you have, say, to a power of a half, so it's dampened, then you don't get power walls anymore. You get some kind of truncated structure. If it's uh, super linear, so say squared, then it takes off and you don't get power walls anymore. Again, you get this really, you get a when it takes off, so you get this sort of delta function for one of them, and the other guys are just a few. Okay, so it's very, so linearity is a very special case. It's a very, very, very special case. Wouldn't get power walls anymore. All right, so it's a rich gets richer story. That's the that's our little tag for this one. Uh, the competition between elements. So this is a couple of key pieces in here. So the competition between elements. Uh, yeah, I, I thought I said elephants. Okay, but so elements. <laughs> that's really. Ah, that's, uh, it's fun being. Okay, so um. Uh, it, that's random. So the, the competition between someone in New York City and some tiny little town, between those two individuals is random. Right? That, that's even. They're evenly matched. But the fact that there's so many people in New York City in this tiny little town means that the chance that you choose New York City, that flavor, is bigger than, much bigger than that. And proportional is it. Right? So the competition for both between groups is not random. Uh, so we, we talk about, uh, you could say it's size, it's size biased, right? So random selection, in some sense, is easy. And I've said that that's a bit tricky, but it feels easy. Uh, and in some sense, you need no great knowledge of the system. So if you're really, truly able to just dive in and pick someone out, then that's or the word out, and that, that works. I might fix that up. Um, it appears to be easy. But think about the first time, so you're sitting there in 1998, imagine you're a fully grown human being at that point, and you're trying to, you know, you're making a web page, it's horrible, it's like HTML minus 1.0 or something, and, and you want to link to things, of course you want to link to pages about cats. So, so what do you, um, you know, how do you do that? How do you randomly find, how do you start to, how, how does this make this play out? How, is it possible that you could randomly find uh, pages, you know, how do you do that? This is Google helps, of course, but then it doesn't because it's bored, you know, it's, it's, it's presenting winners to you. Uh, so, turns out there's a nice version of this that uh, even if you randomly select from individuals, you'll get, them. okay, we'll get to that. We'll get but it's, I, just, I just want it in your heads to think about how this mechanism could actually really work. Right, so a couple other pieces. So we have, it's a steady growth of the system. We're always getting one new, one element. element. I guess you just call it elephant. Oh. <laughs> it's um, uh, And there'll be a, a couple, uh, so this, this is going to be true as well. There's going to be a steady growth of new flavors because we know probably rho, we get a new flavor every time. So we know that uh, rho times t will be, uh, Time will be a fraction of the new flavors. We can add all sorts of other stuff. You can have uh, elements or elephants go away. Uh, you could have elephants move between herds. It's just decaying. So uh, we could have uh, you could change the innovation rate somehow based on size. Right? You need flavors of elephants, and uh, you could and, as, and I've touched on this. You um, you could talk about how group size might have, you could change your Probably of, a, of replication based on group size, right? So, good, for instance, I mean, just a simple example is to introduce a power. You could do all sorts of. We kind of love powers. All right, lots of other good stuff. So, the mechanism is not as simple. We, what I'll come to later on is that the linear attachment uh, mechanism is one you can see how you can argue for how it could happen. If, it's, if you're attaching the groups based on their size to some power that's not one, then it becomes a little harder to see how you would actually do that, how that could play. All right, so let's uh, so we'll go through, we'll, let's tackle this thing and see if we can find out what the distribution of uh, sizes of these groups will be in the long term. Okay, and again, we just start with one, one 
One city, one word, whatever it is, and let it go. Uh, okay, so we're going to have uh, I groups, and K will be the size of uh, group I. We talk about group I. Um, and there, are, there are different ways to tackle this problem. Some are better than others. We'll get to the same solution. In fact, I will say that the Baravazi Yogurt paper, which is you know, pitted science, is a big deal. As I said, many citations to the. And, and they were figuring things out anew, they were unfamiliar with the, with the previous work. Um, uses an approach which does, gets a job done, but it's, it's not as good as perhaps the, the approach that Simon used. Um, it's not as clean. It, it works, but it's not as clean. Alright, so this guy will be the number of groups containing K elephants at time t. Just giving it. Okay. Um, and that's what we're interested in. That's the stuff you've been messing around with in the last uh, few days. And it took you a few minutes to look at it, I guess. But uh, th this guy here, N sub K, right? So it's the number of groups of size K. So it will be the number of uh, unique words that appear K times. Right? So N sub 1 is the number of uh, hapaks that we got, right? Words that appear once in text or language. So how does this change with time? How does this thing change with time? Right? So we start off, we've only got a few. Uh, guys, at the start, it's going to build out. We know we're going to get more of a skewed thing. Of course, we're excited about power laws. We should get to that. Um, so how do we get to that? All right, so a couple of pieces. First of all, we know this. This is always going to be true. It's, not, it's actually much more complicated when we have these different uh, uh, mechanisms, these different powers for, for uh, accruing to groups. If it's linear, this is going to be true. So, uh, so if we k times the number of groups of size k, right, that gives you the total number of words that appear k times each. And then the total number of appearances of all of those words that spread out. The total number of appearances in your text. So if this is 20 times n20, so these are each of these words appears 20 times, multiplied by n sub 20, you get the total number of appearances in the text. Um, well, that has to equal t. So that has to equal to, this is the total number of words. Okay. Okay. So that's a good thing to have. So we want to know about this guy, we know something about it. If we take what looks like the mean here, then um, we have to normalize it, but um, we get t. So that's good. That's going to help. This is sort of a normalization piece. All right. So let's uh, translate what we've, what we've done here with this model. Okay. So we want, I'll introduce a new piece. This is the probability of time t that uh, the new element um, will choose a, a group of size k. Sorry. Yeah, right, right. We'll choose an element of that. So this new guy's appearing, if that's happening. What's the probability of choosing an element that belongs to a group of size k? So what's the probability of choosing someone that lives in New York City? Okay, so we have this many groups that by definition of size k, and then again this piece will appear. So it would be k times the number of groups of size k, that's the number of people that are in groups of that. Um, yeah. right. Right. So groups of size k. So uh, again, say so 20, this gives us the all of the, the total number of words that are appearing 20 times, and it gives us the size of, of, the, of the literature or the text that's sitting there, where if we just randomly choose, uh, we'll hit something that belongs to a group of size 20. All right, and there are T elements overall. So we can do this. We can say the probability of choosing a, a group of size K um, is the number of, number of uh, Elements that are in groups of size k divided by the total number of elements in t. I'm writing by itself. Is this, does, does, that, does that work? No? Okay. And we saw in the previous slide that if we sum over k, we get t, right? So this is a this is normal. This is a good thing. So we have how this is evolving. So, how does it change? So, how does it? So there are two things that can happen. You could, you could 
could be sitting here and you have your book times six, and if the new word is in another book, then this transitions to a uh, book times seven. So it goes from a uh, belonging to uh, groups of size six to groups of size seven. On the other hand, previously in time, there's this possibility that you had book times five, and you get a new book, and then that's going to take you into this category. So if we think about the groups of size six, we can add one to our groups of size six by a group of five, groups one, one element in a group of size five being replicated. That would increase our number here. We'd lose one if a group of size six, one of its elements is replicated as well. So, here is in words, which I possibly just said. So, we have a group of size k, one of its elements is replicated. Now that group is the size of k plus 1. So that's changing. On the other hand, if we have a group of size k minus 1 and one of its elements is replicated, now it's a group of size k. And in this case, we're losing 1. So the total number of groups of time t plus 1 uh, of size k is equal to what we had in the previous time step, minus 1. And in this case, so then this happens. Okay, this here. This happens with probability one minus rho, so we have to remember that guy. One minus rho is the probability that you replicate an existing element. And then this is the probability that you choose a, uh, an element that lives inside a group of size k. On the other hand, we have this transition. So the number of groups of size k is increasing by one the next time step. And this happens with this probability. Well, first of all, we need the probability that we are replicating. And now the index has changed here a little bit, right? So this is k minus 1 and k minus 1. So this is the probability of choosing an element that lives in a group of size k minus 1. So slight differences. There's just a little bit of difference here. A little bit of difference here. This means you're losing one. This means you're gaining one. So we can put those guys together. And then we're going to talk about averaging over many time steps because this is just changing one, one group. How are we doing? Okay. All right. There's a special case for groups of size one because that's where our new elements, when our new baby elephants appear, that's what that they join this this list. So if the new one is a so if our new guy appears, it's a new flavor. I haven't seen it before. Um, then we'll want it included. We'll lose, we'll lose one from this group if we have a unique one, uh, an element that's unique. If it gets replicated, now there are two of them, and it's part of the, group, uh, the, uh, the groups of size two. So in this case, we get a plus one, and that happens with, simply with probability row. Right? So it's different to what we've had. So it's just with probability row, we get a new baby alpha. Um, and with probability 1 minus rho, so this is probably replicating, so it's different to this, probably replicating, and then it's n1t, right? So it's, it's, it's expressed in the probability that you choose an element that's in a group of size 1. That's unique. Right, so just a little modification. This one, this line actually fits with the previous, all of this fits with the previous slide because it's about replication. The different story is really here with the rho. See? Total fun? Yes. So, like, with the example of the elephants, so <laughs> if uh, you could say, like, you have know, population of elephants, and the groups are the age groups, and you can either have new ones born, or you can have ones that are cloned that, like, are the same age. It's like a magical sort of Okay, thing. I was wondering how time went. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, you can do that. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, they cloned. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. You have uh, elephants of different colors, right? And then the cloning would, and then the age thing would, might not be some sort of issue. So, and you want to choose chartreuse, right? So one chartreuse elephant, and then later on in time, it, it gets duplicated by a mad scientist who wants to clone. Yeah. Good. Good. So that helps a lot, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay. 
bring elephants in. There will be elephants later on in this game. Excellent. Great. Um, we need sponsoring organisms. Okay, so we have, let's put everything together. So this is the, so we good? We're good. You can lie to me, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, okay. So, uh, the expected change in one of these guys, the number of groups of size k as we go from uh, time t to time t plus 1, right? so it could be plus 1 or minus 1 or 0, but the expected change will be this. We can pull out one minus row out the front. This is the probability that there's a, there's a plus 1 attached to this. And I guess I could make that more explicit. If you like, there's a plus 1. So this is the, the size of the change, plus 1. We get one more. This is the probability that that happens. And then there's really a minus 1 here that could be made explicit. So that we, this, this is the size of the change. And this is the probability that it happens. And we get the expected change. slightly different, as we've seen. So the expected change in the number of unique elephants, elephants that don't only have, there's only one of them, of their colors, um, will be slightly different. So it's going to be row, that's probably that we uh, get a new one. And then my, this, this should fit with this story. So there's one minus row, that's there. K equals one and one. So one, one. So that's good. So this piece is actually just down here as well. Uh, but row is the chance that we get a new guy. Alright. So this simplifies a little bit. How are we doing with that? This, what about the case when one enters and one leaves? Is that contained in there? So we're doing one at a time. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're doing one at a time. And we can, over time that, that all get that all happens. So that's a complication of the model that's completely reasonable. And you'd have to you know, madly go off it study that one. Right, so you'd have some distribution of the numbers that could have, yeah, that could leave or, or change. Yeah. The essence should stay the same after some you know, perturbation. Anyway, okay. That's one of the big things we'll get to is how, as you fiddle with this me mechanism, how drastically can you change the outcome? And can you change the outcome? Well, this is a universality story. Will this basic kind of plan with a few little modifications and you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, how robust is it? Simon did a good good job of that, trying to figure that out. Uh, so, um, let's assume this happens. We assume the distribution stabilizes. It's going to keep growing because we've still got more uh, elephants appearing. So, the total number is always t. So, we're thinking about the frequency distribution, not the probability distribution. The frequency distribution is stabilizing. So, meaning that the probability distribution, if you normalized it at every time step, would be the same. So it's eventually going to stay. Um, you know, we do these hideous things that uh, mathematicians will tell you it's okay 40 years later. Uh, we're just going to say that this is uh, happening over many time steps, and we have these little changes to each number, and then over time it's okay. Right? So this group will eventually get someone replicated inside it. You know, so but we'll add a little fraction, we'll say a little fraction is happening time uh, on average, so we eventually get, you know, maybe a thousand time steps, we get plus one for that guy, or minus one, depending on what's happening. So, so large time scales. So now we have, uh, yeah, that's a little bonus piece of information, but, but uh, so instead of the, so the, this is the number of groups that have size k. If we divide that by um, rho of t, so a bit sneaky, but this is the this is the number of um, unique uh, elephants. Right? This is the total number of this is the total diversity of the thing. Because right? over time t, you're introducing a fraction rho of new things all the time. So rho times t will be the, the round this off. That'll be the expected value of uh, unique things. So, um, because we're replacing this guy with, this guy's going to be replaced by nk to t here, then these cancel. Uh, okay, so this is a fraction of groups that have size.
All right, so we're going to put that in there. So we're going to replace this is what we have. This is a, uh, a transition. We're just looking at the one for uh, greater than one, for groups of size greater than one. Uh, we're going to replace all of these capital N's with uh, small N's. So these guys are going to be fixed, and we have the sense that the whole thing has just grown. Right? It's reached some saturated uh, structure. So let's stick them in. So these ones become sets of NK ones with a little T here. And you can see these guys are going to cancel with the T's at the bottom. Uh, over here is very nice too. So we have NKT plus 1 plus NKT. So this cancels here. Uh, so that's what this is trying to indicate. Good. Yes, yes. So these guys cancel. We group them together. And we get a nice little difference equation. Right? So you can approach this where you can come out with differential equations. This, this argument ends up with difference equations. Good, meaningful use of such. So, this is uh, cleaning this up. We've got n sub k on the left, 1 minus rho with cleaning up for t's, and you can see there's an n sub k here and an n sub k minus 1. So, we want to express n sub k in terms of n sub k minus 1. So, that's some rearrangement. Um, if you watch what happens here, so we're going to take this guy, it's a minus k n sub k there, grab its 1 minus rho put it all on the left hand side. So n sub k comes to here. That's this, that's that one. There's a one minus rho times k, and that's this piece here, minus k, so it's a plus. That's all over here. What's left is one minus rho times k minus one times nk minus one. So this is looking pretty good at that, because it's n sub k log equals log times n sub k minus one. So let's move to the next. Slide, it's a nice little recursion relation. It has some k's in it, so we have to think about how that's going to work out. Uh, you'll be overjoyed to hear, but I did gamma functions appear and the binomial, uh, the uh, beta, beta function, beta, beta function appears, the egg beta function, uh, but the gamma function, really nice. So it's factorials galore again, right? But grown up factorials, right? The gamma function is uh, factorials for grown ups. <laughs> um, that's going to appear because you can see now you can kind of march down. Right? You can say n sub k uh, equals this times n sub k minus one, and then you replace n sub k minus one in terms of n sub k minus two. Going, 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 and you get what it is in terms of n sub one. So, and then you have to think about how to combine all of these fractions together. Just divisions, really, really, actually. Uh, so we want to look at what happens for large k, tail of the distribution, right? Uh, you can solve your example, <coughs> and that's assignment, well, it's going to be assignment three. Sure. <laughs> and to get at the tail, you can do this, you, don't, you can solve it exactly, you can get at the tail, uh, in a, you know, this is just giving you more um, MacGyver-like uh, experience, you can you can get at the tail without solving the whole thing completely and finding some uh, uh, asymptotic expansion for uh, Gaussians. I mean, gamma functions. All right. So, all right. So you guys do that, uh, and you end up with this. Okay. So you're gonna find this thing. You get to this structure. You can put all this in, I suppose. Um, Alright, so I'm making a bit of a funny argument here, but you, you can get to this in a cheap way. Uh, 1 minus 1 over k, and there's some powers here, and so rho. Rho is the innovation rate you get. Right? This is typically going to be a small number. Uh, and then we'll fiddle around with this a little bit, so we have nk minus 1 here, that matches this k minus 1, nk matches this k. So you can see from that that this guy is, if n sub k is behaving like k to this power minus this power, this guy is behaving like this. Doesn't. So it all it fits then that you have this story. N sub k is, for large k, it's proportional to k to the minus this quantity. It's 2 minus rho over 1 minus rho. Uh, and that is a power law, right? So power wall size distribution. So it came out of this mechanism. That's our gamma. Typically we call this the gamma. And we'll, we'll look at what happens when rho varies. So rho can vary between 0 and 1. To think about exactly what you might do with those limits, but between 0 and 1, this is a correct, correct thing. Um, 
and here's over, right? The love exponent. So gamma is this guy, and it's a bit, it's useful to clean up a little bit. So this is really 1 plus 1 minus rho on top. So it's 1 plus 1 over 1 minus rho. So now you can see what happens as rho goes from 0 to 1, right? So when rho is 0, so that's very low innovation rate. Right? Then we get 2, right? We get gamma equals 2. And that's an extreme case where you're just getting to the mean being very, very nasty. Right? So between 2 and 3, the variance is finite, the mean, the variance is infinite, the mean is finite. Low 2, like the uh, random walk story, the uh, first returns for random walks, you have uh, infinite mean. So it's just on the cusp of that. Many real things are. So that's a that's the story that low row, which is a reasonable story for Right, the evolution of systems, innovation rate is relatively low, you're going to get close to 2. Now, as you increase that uh, innovation rate, you actually dial gamma all the way to infinity. In principle. And it is mathematically true that that's the, this, this gamma, but we've, we've talked about this, right? Gamma greater than 3 is pretty ridiculous. It's just, it's, I mean, you could have it, but you're starting to, you know, now, now you have small variance, small mean, uh, and you might be looking at some other distribution altogether. Um, cool. But very nice. And so, and if you think about what's going on, so rho equals uh, zero, you're getting this low innovation rate, so that's allowing more replication of existing stuff, right? So you're getting these herds of elephants that are very big, same colors. Right? At the other extreme, and that's this big skewed distribution. At the other extreme, when rho is getting close to 1, that means every time, you're, almost every time, you're getting a new type of elephant, right? So then you have a really steep power law, and it's almost like a delta function. <coughs> so that means that your distribution is now, well, everyone is unique. So that's, that makes sense. So when, when you get exactly to that limit of 1, uh, every new Word is a new word, every it's never been seen before, every elephant has never been seen before. And so, um, and um, uh, that, that, that matches up with the sense of where gamma is, uh, how gamma is going to drop Possibly I said all these things again. Yeah. Alright, so that's all I need. It's all good. Good. So, um, this is the so saying these things again, talking, talking. Uh, so Zipf's law is an extra bit back here. So this is the size as a function of rag, k is minus alpha, and we found the connection between the Zipf's law exponent and the frequent size distribution exponent. Alpha is one over um, gamma minus one. So gamma equals two corresponds to this alpha equals one case, and that's that's what Zipf observed in many different cases, right? So we're thinking about Herbert Simon in 1955, this paper. In, uh, talking about what Zip would observe. So this is a you know, really nice story that's coming up. Low innovation rate is reasonable. Um, so well done. And so that's a story. Oh yeah. <coughs> so uh, so we, we, often, we often see this is not so for everything, but we often see this alpha equals one. So it's a, so it's a, it's a bit of a win there if you're um, sitting inside Simon's head and thinking about that uh, at the time. Uh, Krugman didn't like this. So, so actually, I found out about this paper from a, a book Krugman wrote many years ago called uh, actually, I can't remember what is it? it's, uh, The Self-Organizing of Parents. It's this little book and it's all about it. So it has science model in it. And this is it was when I was at the Santa Fe Institute. It's a crazy Venezuelan friend of mine. Um, I'll get it to it. Um, uh, and and Sabrina. So, and then, and then I was back at MIT, and Krugman was there for one year before he poached him somewhere else, somewhere else and so I think. So I, actually, and he didn't have a good record, he didn't have a reference for it properly in the book, so I wrote to him, and incredibly he wrote that, you know, time to that. But he said he didn't really like this story, right? It's actually completely fine, but he, it was sort of an economist thing where it's not exactly analytically correct or something, so it kind of goes. Very simple. Okay, so, um, all right, there are many other mechanisms that are possible. We have to think about them. We have to look at what's happening with real systems where we can truly observe the growth of them. Bit of a nasty thing. I mean, you'd think we'd be able to, okay, well, let's just work it out of the web of all. It's, there's a lot of randomness in there. 
that you have to account for. And you have to be pretty careful with uh, how you characterize the growth of things. You want to see, is this story of linear growth working? Right? So, uh, uh, you know, if it's the Linux kernel, are modules being connected to by other uh, modules or packages, or whatever it is, um, as a function of this size, linearly as a function of this size. So the chance that a new package emerging links to them is like that. Does it work for citations? So if you have a well-cited paper, is its chance of being cited twice as much as one that has half as many citations? Or is it 10 times? Is there, is there, a, is there a, a stronger rich case for So you have to look at the details here. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Later. So we have one other thing to deal with, uh, and that's not the end of this guy, but it's the, uh, the innovation of the, the, the new individuals. Um, so we did the same. We do the same thing again. We uh, get rid of. Uh, we replace. We expect this thing to grow with time linearly. So we're going to replace this uh, capital M one, the number of unique uh, elements, with a little fixed M one. T, so we'll drop expectations. So this is a very nice other little piece that's coming out of here. What we've just looked at is the uh, n sub k for large k. So this is a pretty cool thing that Simon was aggregate. So he's got a good match for that. He's going to get a good match for the other bit, the small n1. So kind of cool. Um, okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to replace these guys. So this is m1 t plus 1 here. That's minus m1 t. So row 1 minus row, and this guy becomes just m1 t. So those guys are going to here and uh, same thing happens as the previous slide. So we have m1t that's going to cancel here, so we just get m1 on the left as a row minus one minus row m1. So there's no n2 in this case, right? Well, no n0 that would be uh, that we had before. So we just have m1 and row, so we can rearrange this. Uh, we'll do the right thing, you just stick this guy on the left hand side, we'll add them up. So we have uh, there's a it's going to be 2 minus rho times n1 equals rho. So if we do this, then we have this number, and of course it's growing. This is, you multiply it by t, you get a real uh, direction. Rho over 2 minus rho. So again, when rho goes to 0, that seems to be the interesting case from a, from a real perspective, and, from, and it also seems to be matching up with, with real phenomena. Uh, then we get to this, this thing disappears, but we have to think about what this is. So, uh, there's another step here. Um, all right, so the, the total number is a function of time, which is multiplied back by t, so we get rho t over 2 minus rho. Um, so we have to think about this. The number of distinct types of elephants, right? So look at here are all the different types of groups, We're counting the number of groups, distinct groups, is growing on rho t. Right, so the so the fraction of uh, so if we just take we just we imagine uh, you know, here's your text and you just create a dictionary out of it, right? You just have so you just write the down once it appears in this book many, many times. So you just put the down and up. so you want to count and then you find all of the guys that appear once and you want to see what fraction of all of the words are in that box. So. We have to divide the total, the number of groups of size 1 by the total number of groups. That's what we're doing. So that's this piece. And if we divide through that, rho t disappears, we get 1 over 2 minus rho. And rho going close to 0, right, this is going to be close to 1 and a half. And then we go and look at some real things. So, um, so that's close to a half. This is roughly observed for many real distributions. And I think I have an example in the next slide. Um, as rho increases, that fraction moves away from a half. The most extreme thing is one, which makes sense, so everyone's in the unique uh, case. Um, and you can, you can of course, solve this exactly. Right? I mean, you can solve it exactly, but and, and it's interesting to think about the ones that appear once, and twice, and three times. So the ones that appear twice, uh, at the limit of rho going to zero, you get a sixth. Right? So a half, a sixth. Uh, and this is this pretty outstanding achievement for a very simple, obviously not completely correct model um, in some ways. It works at both ends of the distribution. 
So let's look at some data. This is actually uh, from Simon. So what you can do is you're sort of looking at text. Uh, and I think you looked at James Joyce. You can estimate your row by simply taking the number of unique words divided by the number of whole words, right? So the number of groups of size one divided by the number of total number of groups. Uh, so not looking at how this thing evolved, this is just taking this big static picture of, at the end and saying, right? So there's a, there's a complication when you look at how words are introduced as you go through a text. Are they appearing linearly? That's not really the case. So that's, that's a confounding issue. Uh, for Ulysses, he had, I'm quoting, I think, this is directly 0.115. Uh, which, is, which is a good amount. Um, and so here are the estimates coming out of that using this uh, 1 over 2 months row. So this is the real number of words that appear uh, once, 16,000. And just estimating it using this formula, it's pretty close, right? So this is a nice, and this is. This is then, this should, this should be the sixth story. So this is the half of sixth. Uh, also very close. Okay, so it's just that. So that's rather remarkable. Okay, no, many, many, many mechanisms, it's all just about the tail of the distribution, and you can get this power law, and it's not really that's what it Yeah, that, that's a big achievement. Uh, this, this works at both ends. Uh, okay, so, well done. Uh, I've got a few little pieces before we get on to Man of Bright, I think I can run through some of this. So, I mentioned this, this uh, historical sequence of work and how it's this, this sort of breaks in it in terms of uh, kind of collective memory or knowledge of, of where things have come from. So, Simon's paper spilled off Yule's paper, it's directly attributed to it. And I should have talked about the evolution of catchphrases here, right? The, the way you, I mean, this, this is the narrative hierarchy. Do you have a good way of putting a handle on your story? So this is a mathematical theory of evolution, which is a spectacular title. You know, you've got to back it up with the insight. But, but based on the conclusions of, uh, you know, I mean, then it just gets this kind of a very old English kind of geeky sort of thing to put it in So that, that feels a little weird. Simon's paper does not, it's just not good. On a class of skew distribution functions, it just does not invite you in the door. It's like, <laughs> terrific, Herbert. Thank you a lot. Um, but his introduction is much better. His introduction ramps it up. So the purpose of this paper to analyze a class of distribution functions that fit a wide range of empirical data, particularly data describing sociological, biological, and economic phenomena. And this could have been written, you know, this is a woman, right? Its appearance is so frequent, a phenomena is so diverse, that one is led to conjecture that if these phenomena have any property in common, it can only be a similarity in the structure of the underlying probability mechanisms. Terrific. So that's good. Now you feel like you're, you know, you want to you join in the right, but the thing over the door, that's it. Alright, Herbert Simon, so, very good. He's a, he was a political scientist, but he did all sorts of things. Big deal with uh, computer science, which of course was evolving through his, his uh, career, public administration, economics, management, social, all sorts of stuff. Uh, he came up with, uh, funny words, but bounded rationality, trying to pull the economists back from the, the precipice a little bit. Uh, that, you know, people can only do so many things with their heads. You know, if you read, of course you can, this is, this is, you know, now we have behavioral economics and you can enjoy yourself tremendously by reading things like Kahneman and you know, seeing what we've done, seeing what we figured out about this now, and satisfies them. Which is a terrible work, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's the idea that you, it's not optimization, right? So you want to buy something, you go into the first shop and, and the thing that, if you go to shops, it crosses some bar that you have in your head, or it's a bar and you're like, okay, that's fine. Instead of going to every shop and comparing all of them, so you have maximizers versus satisfies. Satisfies tend to have a better time in life. Um, you know, a thousand publications. He was an early leader in all sorts of things. They do. I don't think I list all these. Decision making. Fair. I mean, just a super. And he got himself a Nobel Prize. Right. Well done. Uh, Derek just saw the price was in there. So he was the first person to think about network evolution, which is gigantic. Uh, it didn't have I don't know, the data we have, but, but he pulled it all out. So um, it's for scientific papers. He was trying to look about how knowledge expands. He has really great stuff talking about uh, how the literature connects back into the past, talking about the half life of the literature, right? Sort of how, it changed, how it's been shrinking and changing in different places. Cumulative advantage. So that was the step. That was, that's a little better. Right? Cumulative advantage. So if you're out in front, 
the, the, the Richard and Cruz uh, first thing from. Uh, and here's the story. And so papers, if he's thinking only about papers, papers received new citations, probably as important as their existing normal citation. So it took Simon's model, got it to work, directed network, and he had um, a couple of ways of dealing with things. So a new paper has no citation. So it's a zero, so it should never be cited. So he kind of tweaked that a little bit to make that work. And then a selection mechanism is clearly more complicated. But he was able to translate it. It was published in science. I mean, it was not a, an esoteric publication. Uh, well known. This guy. Uh, so Robert Merton. So I, he was at Columbia when I was there, and uh, he's, he's passed away. But uh, he uh, lived, lived to an incredible age and uh, did all sorts of things. And so one of his uh, you know, famous pieces of his work is studying thinking about scientists and how uh, how scientific careers were. And, and so he was able to show that if you started well, you got a big hit early on, then that was a big deal. And, was, and he had a couple, he framed this very well, so he called it the Matthew effect. Right? So this is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, For everyone that hath shall be given. Right? So, and we came up, one of the students in here came up with the units of hath. You could talk about hath. How much hath you have. But there's actually a little more to that statement. The mechanism is a little more complicated. But from him that hath not, that also which he seemeth to have shall be taken away. That's not built into this one. <laughs> um, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. Not how the mechanism. Um, but just to be clear, that's what I think he's getting at. So this is a suggested unit of the purchasing power. It's actually Paul Lassar for 10 minutes and more. Um, there's the Matilda effect. Which is not a good one. So it's that women's scientific achievements are often overlooked. So there's a nice, you know, sort of, and, and this is stuff that's built off, you know, looking at stuff analytically, adding up numbers. Uh, so Merton was a catchphrase machine. I'm gonna, so he came up with self fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> you know, identified it as a thing and said, I'm going to call it this. Uh, role model, uh, unintended consequences. I mean, this is all the time. Unanticipated, unanticipated. He took that focus interview, which became the focus group concept. So it's not. So he built these ideas as well. Uh, also, his son was a won a Nobel Prize in, in economics. So again, well done. Good one, um, I think I'll, I'll bring this up at the start of next time, and that's so that I'm not going to take this. This is about the Albert. Think about the web. This is the 1998 work. They basically <coughs> reinvented this Simon and, and uh, Gisela Price work on networks, preferential attachments. This is what you'll hear all the time. You will hear cumulative advantage as well, but preferential attachment. Um, uh, undirected networks, it's okay, it's fine. Uh, this is a selection problem. We'll deal with this later on. on this level. Uh, they also, so, so that's the mechanism, and I just want to say this, they, they um, so call this. They came up with this term as well, scale free networks. So, because the distributions of the number of friends or nodes uh, um, a degree, if you like, number of friends in these networks have uh, uh, these power distributions that we're talking about. And this is basically a total assignment. So, it's just been a rampage of that for many years. So, that's, a, that's good. That is exactly what I want to do too. And liberation. Okay. So it's a great, great story. It's a great, great, great story.